Yes. Um, yeah, let's get started. Uh, so we were looking before the break at the parallels between uh, Lucifer and Adam. Uh, Adam was created to be the guardian, um, the ruler of the earth. And Lucifer was created to be uh, the guardian of the holy mount of God. And uh, Lucifer was clothed, adorned in, the, in precious stones. And he was blameless. In the same way, you know, uh, Adam was clothed in the very glory of God, and uh, he too was, uh, you know, um, created holy. And uh, so they both were people of great status. And then, uh, you know, this is what Satan did with himself. And now he wants to drag down Adam and Eve also to the same level as him. So uh, if we could, uh, someone could read out for us Ezekiel chapter 28. Verses 16 to 18, please. 28, 16 to 18. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 16 to 18. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and your sins. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, O God, and Sheru, from among the fairy stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth and made a spectacle of you before kings by your yeah, many sins. Yeah, yeah, that, that should be enough. So we see yeah. that, uh, you know, here in all of these verses, there is still a kind of, um, you know, parallel being drawn between the king of Tyre and, uh, you know, Lucifer. So there are portions where it talks about uh, the trade of the king of Tyre and all of that. But then you have other portions uh, which are di directly referring to Satan himself. So here it's talking about how uh, uh, Satan was, you know, I, I was driven in dis, in disgrace from the mount of God in the same way that Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden in disgrace. Uh, so it says, I expelled you, garden Cherub, from among the fiery stones. And of course, Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. And uh, it, it says uh, regarding Lucifer, you corrupted your wisdom. OK, so he was very, very wise. Uh, what, what, I mean, what in fact, what did we see the wording earlier? Um, here in verse 12, uh, I think, yeah, verse 12, he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, but now he has corrupted his wisdom due to his pride, uh, you know, in, in his splendor and his beauty. So he has corrupted his wisdom, and um, so now he wants to do the same thing to Adam and Eve, and so he brings this temptation before them. These, this is a one couple that was, was always kept their eyes on the Lord. They have been completely dependent on the Lord. They know nothing. Whatever God says, they just simply accept it as little children. They submit to that. They obey him and follow him. And they are just you know um, carefree uh, because they just simply do whatever God asks them to do. So their eyes are completely focused always on him. But now, you know, Satan is making the offer and says, your eyes will be opened. Something else will happen. Then you will know good and evil. You will have the knowledge of good and evil is what he says. And so when they choose that to accept that lie and when they eat of the fruit, their eyes are opened and they receive this knowledge of good and evil. And uh, what is the first result of that? They discover that this uh, this independence which they now have, where they can make their own decisions about what is good and evil. What is that? What is that, that, that done? It has stripped them of the holiness of God. It has completely stripped them of the glory of God. They are just now left naked, helpless, nothing. I mean, they, they were rulers. They were clothed in glory. They were, uh, they had everything. And now, and, and they were wise. <laughs> they, I mean, Adam had the wisdom to correctly name all of creation. That was their status. And now that they have chosen to have their eyes opened and they, and no, they long, no longer want to keep their eyes on God. Now they want to have their eyes opened and they want to have, make their own decisions independently. And the first thing they understand is that um, it has stripped them 
of their dependence of God. It has stripped them of the glory that was theirs through him. Now they have nothing. Now they're on their own and they are naked. And all they can do is take a pathetic bunch of leaves and try to cover themselves. I mean, it's like so, um, such a low, you know, being brought down so low. And I think Satan just rejoiced at that moment because, you know, kind of must have brought you know, some kind of satisfaction to his evil heart that now this uh, humans also have been reduced to his pathetic condition. Uh, so that's what they did to themselves. And one thing they realize is that humans, you know, they realize that this knowledge of good and evil, even though now they possess it on their own independently, they are not able to handle it correctly at all. I mean, yes, they may have the knowledge of good and evil now in their hands, but you know, it says in Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, talking about the sinful people of Nineveh, it says those 120,000 people, they don't even, they cannot even tell their right hand from their left. What did the knowledge of good and evil do for them? Nothing. If you're if you try to function independently of God, you really are nothing. You really can do nothing. And uh, so we were never meant to be independent. We were always meant, we were created to be dependent on him, to be connected to him, to abide in him. And when we do that, his glory, his provision, his blessing, you know, flows into us. Uh, and we are empowered to be all that we are meant to be. So, so now, after all this horrible mistake which Adam and Eve did, we have now been restored back to our, uh, you know, uh, earlier position. Uh, we've been given back what Adam had. I know all of it is not yet fulfilled. Uh, partially, we have stepped into that. Uh, we will completely get that, you know, uh, in the new Jerusalem uh, when when God restores uh, all of mankind. Because right now, creation is still under the curse, and we still see death and decay and all of that. Uh, so yes, I know that we are. It's not we are not fully restored yet. Um, positionally, we are fully restored, of course. Uh, but when it comes to at a practical level, that will happen. Um, on, I mean, uh, on that you know at that time when God begins the next phase of eternity. So right now, of course, um, uh, we already have the uh, status positionally. And who are we st uh, positionally? Revelation chapter one, verse six. If someone could read out. Revelation 1, verse 6. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. And has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father to him. Be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So what have we now become? Uh, it says that we have become that Greek word basileia and we have become priests. That word Basileia literally means kingdom and royal power. So now we are people with royal power, uh, you know, uh, operating his kingdom. So in that sense, we are kings and we are priests. And now we are once more serving God the way Adam was meant to be serving God. Now we are once more in that position of serving God. And that is why, you know, uh, Jesus says to the people who are kind of showing an interest in believing in him. You know, they're kind of beginning to believe his words. And this is what Jesus says to them. John chapter 8, verses 31 to 36. Is, um, maybe we could just look at uh, John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. Yeah, if someone could read out John 8, 31 to 32, please. Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Okay, so uh, to these Jews who have now started to believe him, he says to them, you know, you need to continue abiding in my word, he says. Because if you abide in my word, then you will continue to get to know more and more of the truth. And the more and more you step into the truth, the more and more you will be set free. The more and more you'll get back to the status that you may, you know, you were actually meant to have. So uh, it is so important to abide in my word. And then, if we could also read out verses 34 to 36, John 8, 34 to 36. John 8, verse 34 to 36, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, 
a slave has no permanent place in the family but a son belongs to it forever so if the son sets you free you will be free indeed i know you are abraham's descendant yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room yeah. for my word all right yeah yeah so over here you know jesus is saying uh, that as long as you are you know uh, don't abide in me you will continue being slaves of sin you see independently on our own we can never be what god uh, you know has planned for us for that complete dependence is needed we need to abide in him as we are abiding in him we get to know his truth and we choose to believe that it is truth and we choose to hold on to it submit to it obey it so even as we are doing that the son sets us free the son of god he begins to set us free completely so that we are no longer under the control of uh, sin and you know uh, slaves to it so um, um we choose to believe in the word of god that it is 100% truth and we choose to abide in it even if it seems difficult we choose to do that because even as we are doing that our mind gets renewed it starts Uh, absorbing the truth of god and it starts functioning the way a child of god should be functioning so you see uh, it's so important to abide you only when you are abiding your mind starts getting renewed you start knowing the truth and even as your mind gets renewed you know the son of god is just able to set you free so it's all interconnected and it all comes down to you believing that the word is truth 100% truth and abiding in it and when as you do that you once again start becoming a king you start you once again start you know having a uh, dominion so you are no longer a helpless slave but over all the circumstances and situations that come into your life you are able to once more have victory and you are able to serve god as his priest and honor him in the beauty of holiness so um, uh, so it is so vital to believe in the truth of god's word uh, ephesians 4 22-23 also makes a very important statement regarding this ephesians 4 22-23 please ephesians chapter 4 verse 22-23 you however did not come to know christ that way surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in jesus you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its disciple desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds at 24 24 and to put on the new self created to be like god in true righteousness and holiness okay so uh he says over here to these ephesian believers uh you have been taught in accordance with the truth that is in jesus okay so because you choose to believe that you know what jesus has said is true on a daily basis you need to put off the old self because that old self was in fact crucified you know it was it was crucified and uh, you know dumped now you don't have to uh, bring it back from the dead and put it on it would be such a pathetic uh, it would be such a foolish thing to do you know so um you have to you don't have to again you know bring back that dead body and wear it you know on a daily basis because now you are a new creation so put off your old self and start putting on your new self you are a new creation so start putting on that new new that uh, that that newness of you you know and um, um, uh, follow you know uh, this truth abide in this truth submit to this truth and this is what it says he says you know in ephesians 4 24 put on the new self created to be like god in true righteousness and holiness so even as you choose to no longer bring back that dead crucified self and put on that dead body all over again instead of doing that being so foolish as to do that rather believe in the truth abide in the truth of 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 jesus words and even as you submit and abide in those words you will start becoming you know once more like god that righteousness of god and that holiness of god will begin to you know clothe you adorn you and um, you will walk in the beauty of you know god's holiness so these things will happen to us so we can independently never be like god we are meant to be dependent being we are meant to abide in him and um, so 
it says in Revelation 3, 4 to 5. Uh, I think yeah, this is important. If someone could read out Revelation 3, 4 to 5, please. Revelation chapter 3, verse 4 to 5. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes will let them be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. Okay, so these white garments are not just going to be given away to anyone who just, you know, uh, turns up. It says... There are some people you know, who have chosen to identify with me. You know, so they are choosing, uh, even in their difficult circumstances, you know, in Sardis, they are still choosing uh, to live in a way uh, that is holy. They are not defiling their garments. So obviously, this is all symbolic language. Uh, it's not talking about you know you you walking in the mud and splashing your clothes. No, it's talking in a in a in a symbolic manner. So by keeping themselves holy. They are not defiling their garments. These are the people. These are the people who have chosen to abide in him in spite of the temptations of the world, in spite of the pressure which the world is exerting on them, in spite of the persecutions and the ridicule that they are facing. In spite of all of that, they are choosing to abide in him. They are choosing to hold on to the truth because they know that if they hold on to the truth, then God will indeed reward them one day. And he says that such people they are going to wait, wear white garments on that day and they will walk with me in white. So if we kind of refuse to you know, abide and be dependent on him and we say, I'm going to be independent and I'm going to do my own thing, you're going to be like Adam and Eve in that, in that garden and they were stripped naked and they could see that they, how, sh how shamed their position was. So... Um, uh, on our own, we can have no dignity. On our own, we are nothing. When you're dependent on him, when you abide in him, his holiness is imparted to you. He will grant you those white garments. He will clothe you in his holiness and righteousness. Uh, you know, because um, uh, on that day, you know, you can't exactly take your uh, you know, designer wear and stand over there in front of God's throne with those. Uh, you will be clothed in whatever he is giving you. And if you are, you're not clothed in what he is giving you, you're going to be just standing there exposed, naked. I mean, I, I don't mean that physically. Maybe physically, maybe sim, I mean, metaphorically. I have no clue how things are going to work on that day, on Judgment Day. But the sheer humiliation of just standing there in your own strength, it's, so, it's going to be so pathetic. You're going to be so naked, so exposed. But if you have chosen to abide in him, you will be clothed in his holiness. And you will be a glorious sight to behold on that day. So it's all our choice whether we are going to hold on to the truth of God's word, hold on to the truth of these things which are being revealed to us and take them seriously and stay in him and abide in him and enjoy the benefits of that. You know, because when we abide in him, that is when the nature of God is going to be produced in us. That fruit is going to be produced. That is when we are going to become into the likeness of Christ. You can't say, I want to not be connected to God. I don't want to be, I want to, don't want to abide in the wine. And that fruit of uh, the nature of God is not going to be formed in you. You're not going to become into the likeness of Christ. So then on that day, what are you going to be clothed in? You know, so these are extremely serious matters. These are matters of life and death. These are matters of eternity and damnation. I mean, extremely serious things. So uh, this is not something to be taken lightly. And uh, so, you know, Galatians 3.27, um, uh, you know, uh, um, Paul is reminding his audience about who they are and what they are clothed in. Galatians 3.27, if someone could read out. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. I mean, we were baptized into Christ. We placed our faith in him. We are now literally clothed in Christ. So please, you know, it, it, it's like as if he's saying, you know, please let's abide in Christ. We are clothed in him. If you choose not to abide in Christ and you want to give up that your clothing, what are you left with? 
I mean, uh, there is nothing but shame and humiliation. So he says, you were baptized into Christ because you chose to believe. Now hold on to that. You know, continue, continue being clothed in Christ. Uh, let him be your covering. Let him be your righteousness. Let him be your glory. You know, so um, these are all, uh, you know, things that he's pressing upon their hearts. And uh, so then he goes on, you know, um, I mean, uh, there are so many passages uh, which urge us to stay clothed in Christ, you know. So, um, you know, we have Hebrews 12 uh, verses 10 to 11, which talk about discipline. And it says over there in Hebrews 12, 10 to 11, God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. Why is he disciplining us? Because he wants to share his holiness with us. And uh, so it says in verse 11 over there, you know, Hebrews 12, 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time because it's a painful thing. You know, so very, very frankly, it says here, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. So abiding in um, the wine is going to be painful, uh, very, very painful. But it will produce a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So because we have that hope, because we believe in that truth, we choose to hold on. We choose to abide. We choose to be disciplined. And that is why in the same way, you know, in, in Matthew 5, 29 to 30, Matthew 5, 29 to 30, it says, if your right eye is causing you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. Again, you know, it's uh, symbolic language and it's being used over here because it um, it's bringing out the, the seriousness of what is being stated. You know, so if your right eye is causing you to stumble, you know, uh, better for you to just pluck it out and throw it away because at least then your soul will be saved and you will be able to stand before the judgment of, uh, uh, you know, throne of God secure in him. So it is something so important. And uh, so in the same way, symbolically, if you're meant to uh, you know, uh, pluck out your right eye at a physical level, what are the things that you would need to pluck out? You know, if your eye is causing you to sin, uh, then maybe you should just cut off, cancel off that, you know, your subscription to all those online entertainment channels. Because, if, you know, if again and again, if you're being drawn into the wrong things, where's the point in having those, you know, uh, online channels? Cancel your subscription, cut them off. If you're again and again being, uh, you know, led by your friends um, uh, into, into doing wrong, sinful things, cut them off. So at a symbolic level, you're supposed to be, you know, putting, uh, pulling out your eye. But at a physical level, you know, you're commanded to treat your body as a, as a holy temple of God. So at a physical level, you would not be plucking out your eye. And it would not really not do you much good because uh, the sin which is there in your unrenewed mind, the sin which is inhabiting your body is still going to be there anyway. So plucking out your eye is not going to be doing you much good. But it is symbolic language to being used over here to bring out the seriousness of what is expected. So if something is you know, hindering you and pulling you back into sin, cut it off. It's going to be a painful amputation. I mean, for some, canceling their you know, online entertainment channels is going to be like, it's going to, it's going to feel like death. Because, I mean, that's what they look to for their entertainment. But if that is leading you to sin, cut it off. You know, because this it, this is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of eternity. Uh, it's a matter of, you know, either either having to stand before the judgment uh, throne of God naked and shamed or being clothed in, in, you know, in the righteousness, white garments of God and, you know, being covered. I mean, these are serious issues. This is, this is our future that we are talking about. Uh, so these are very, very serious matters. And therefore, we choose to consecrate ourselves and walk blameless. Um, and uh, this is what Isaiah 57, 15 says. Uh, if someone could read out Isaiah 57, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. For this is what the high and lofty one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Uh, the Lord says, you know, I dwell in the high and holy place. He's a God of holiness and he lives at a very high level. 
But he says, I also live with those who are contrite and humble. And I will revive their spirit. You know, he says, to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So all this amputation is going to be very, very painful. But he says when someone is willing to humble themselves to that extent, where they are willing to cut off those things which are holding them back, and where they're willing to show the reverence to me, you know, and uh, you know, removing all those contaminants which are contaminating their body and spirit, and when they're honoring me in that way, he says, even though I'm someone so high and I live in a high and holy place, I will make my dwelling with these people, with these humble people who are willing to go to the extent of you know gouging out those things and throwing them away which are standing in the way and even though it is so painful they are doing it because they want to honor me because they believe in my truth they believe that one day they will indeed be rewarded for it because they have trusted me to that extent i will make my dwelling with them not to crush them he says but to revive their spirit but to revive their heart so we will be strengthened by the Lord. We will not be left crushed and miserable. Uh, you know, so God is there for us. He will help us. But from our side, we would need to humble ourselves. We would need to amputate those things which are against him. We would need to abide in him. We would need to be, you know, consciously keep that connection strong by a daily cleansing. So these are responsibilities that have been placed on our shoulders because then uh, we can, you know, uh, regain what Adam lost. You know, we are uh, through Jesus Christ. We can now regain all that, uh, you know, uh, that was lost by our original uh, uh, father, human father. Yeah, Adam. So uh, this one other aspect that, you know, we would need to look at, um, we, you know, which is, uh, in you know, involved in this whole abiding process and this whole humbling process one very 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 important aspect of this whole abiding first uh, thessalonians chapter 3 verses 12 and 13 if someone could read out first thessalonians 3 12 to 13 please first thessalonians chapter 3 verse 12 to 13 may the lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our god and father when our lord jesus comes with all his holy ones okay so one very important aspect of abiding of humbling uh it's this whole thing about you know increasing in love towards one another how we relate to each other how we choose to live in love towards one another not an easy thing very very difficult people are not easy to put up with people are the ones who bring us greatest joy you know if you if you've ever noticed it's always the people who bring the greatest joy but it's also people who can really make life a struggle so how we treat those people, oh my God, takes it so seriously. Because here we're talking about his children, his sons and daughters. And he, for him, each person is very precious. Now, you may look at on a certain person as a pain in the neck. But for God, that person is extremely precious. So be very careful in the way you, um, you know, behave with different people. In the, in the decisions that you take towards them, against them. Be very cautious. Are you doing it in line with the will of God? Or are you just acting out of you know your own convenience and maybe out of your own ego? Because if we are not you know increasing in love and causing our love to overflow towards each other, like it says over here, uh, you know, um, then we will not be walking in holiness because he says over here, may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy. You will be blameless and holy if you know you're increasing in your love. You're overflowing with love towards each other. It's something that happens on a daily basis where you choose to walk in holiness. Um, um, this is what uh, most of our Christian life is about because it's all about people, right? So how we treat them, how we relate to them, the words that we speak to them, the, the decisions that we take regarding them. You know uh, whether to harm them 
or whether to bless them, whether to tear them down or whether to build them up. And God is watching and God takes it very seriously when you're touching even one child of God. So this is something that we need to be very careful about. Um, this is an important part of abiding in him. So are you willing to stand on the truth of God's word, accept his word as being 100% true? And so you are going to be doing a lot of you know, painful things to, uh, to, to be loving towards that person. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice. But you choose to believe that God in his time will bless you for that, reward you for that. He will you know, um, help you to do that. And so you choose to believe in the truth of his word rather than all the lies which Satan is feeding into your ears and saying, you know, ah, you know, uh, this person doesn't deserve it. So, you know, you don't really, after all that the person has done, no, it's okay. I mean, you can, you can treat them the way you want. And Satan is fe feeding all of these lies. But do you choose to hold on to the truth of God's word and say, no, I choose to hold on to what God is saying. And so I will treat this person in this way only. I will be holy in my attitude towards them and the decisions that I take towards them. If you, when you when you stand for God in that manner, then you will indeed be blameless and holy. And God Himself will strengthen your heart. He will help you in this. You you cannot do this on your own. In fact, none of these things can ever be done independently on our own. But even as we abide in Him, when He sees that we are walking in step with Him, He will empower us to walk by His power, you know, by the power of His Holy Spirit. He will you know do that for us. So this is one very important aspect of our abiding that we need to be conscious of. <laughs> Moving on to some of the important things that are mentioned in chapter 6, you know, which talks about the beauty of holiness. Uh, so uh, we'll just very quickly, you know, try to look at some of those things. Um, so these, these would be things which are there in your uh, notes in chapter 6. Uh, let's maybe begin by looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29. First Chronicles 16.29, please. If we could have someone please read out. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It is not enough to just bring him an offering. How are you bringing that offering to him? You need to bring it in the beauty of holiness. Are you clothed in the beauty of holiness? Over here, the word that is being used over there, that's the word uh, hadar, OK? Uh, the, the word for beauty, the Hebrew word for beauty that is being used over here, it is hadar. Hadar basically is um, the glory that is possessed by that particular person. So when you're talking about the beauty of God's holiness, the hadar of uh, you know uh, God's holiness, you're basically talking about the glory that he possesses. So um, here, when it's talking about human beings you know, walking in the hadar of holiness, it's talking about people who are coming covered in that glory. They're choosing to live holy lives. And so God's glory is resting upon them. And so they come in that beauty and make their offerings. So if they are coming you know, with their uh, offerings in a sinful condition, there's no beauty in that. And um, your offerings would not be acceptable, actually, you know, because you're bringing uh, your offerings with unclean hands, uh, with an unclean heart. Uh, so uh, and there is no repentance, you know. So that's the whole point. The point is, are you repentant? Are you sensitive to him? When he corrects, are you willing to, you know, say yes, Lord, I'm wrong? And are you willing to submit and correct yourself? As long as that repentant attitude is there, oh, that's more than enough. So here I'm not talking about perfection because you know we are all going to be uh, failing in this or that uh, because we are still learning. Uh, but if you have a very repentant attitude where you're willing to quickly, as soon as the Lord convicts you, if you're willing to correct yourself, and if you have that humble attitude, then, then you really are clothed in this uh, you know, beauty of holiness. You're clothed, you, you're, you're, you possess this glory of God, 
and you're walking in that, you're covered in that. So whatever offerings you're bringing before him, you're bringing it in the beauty of holiness and you will be acceptable. It's another aspect uh, to this whole beauty uh, of holiness. There's another term that is used, you know, another Hebrew term. Uh, so if someone could read out Psalm 90 verse 17, 90, 17. Ninety, right? Nine zero. Yes, ninety. Okay. Psalm chapter ninety, verse seventeen. Okay. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So here, rather than using the word uh, beauty in our English, I know in a, in, a, in the NIV translation, it says, "Let the favor of the Lord our God." be upon us uh, but um, you know in Hebrew the actual literal word uh, it's talking about another aspect of beauty Hadar was one word for beauty now this is a different word for beauty and it's the word Noam okay so um, this is um, uh, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us as in uh, his delight rests upon us his favor rests upon us um, so when uh, we when we choose to walk in the holiness of god and uh, you know he shares his glory with us so that we are you know sharing in the hadar of god in that in that beauty in that glorious beauty of his holiness even as we are walking in that uh, when we choose to do all our works in that manner, you know, uh, then God will, uh, God's favor rests upon us. Uh, so that kind, that beauty, in that sense, his delight, his delight rests upon us and we are acceptable. And also another aspect of this uh, word Noam, uh, you know, this beauty, it's a beauty which uh, not only just rests upon us, it is also a beauty that gets reflected as in people who see us, you know, they see the beauty of what is uh, of what we are doing, and they praise God for it. So, you know, um, maybe one simple example of that would be, you know, Matthew chapter five, verse sixteen. If someone could read out Matthew five sixteen. Matthew chapter five. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Okay, so it talks about how you let, let your light uh, so shine before men. So, you know, in a way, I mean, drawing a parallel, you could say, uh, what, is this what is this light which is shining? That's basically, you know, the glory of God, right? I mean, you're walking in holiness. You're choosing to do what God wants you to do. So, you know, that light is shining out through you. His glory is shining out through you uh, because you're honoring him. You're walking in holiness. So that light is shining through you and it expresses itself basically through good works. So this good works which you are doing, you know, it causes God's noam, his favor to just rest upon you. He delights in you. But it's also something which people see because his delight is resting upon you. This beauty is resting upon you. People see that you are beautiful. And they think, uh, and, and they don't just restrict themselves uh, to saying, you know, oh, you are a beautiful person. They also see from where the beauty has come. They recognize that it is the beauty of God which is resting upon you. And so they glorify the Father in heaven. They say, oh my, God is using this person uh, to, to bring so much goodness into our lives. This person, uh, the hands of the, uh, the, the work of their hands is blessing us. And so they say, Father, thank you. Thank you for this person. Thank you for using this person in this way to be such a blessing to us. And they glorify the Father. So what happens in the process? The glory goes back to him. Uh, so it's all interconnected. Um, uh, so we can't um, exactly like you know put Hadar and Noam and all into watertight compartments. Uh, they're all interconnected. Uh, so even as we choose to walk in holiness, uh, his glory is there, uh, you know, uh, clothing us. 
and his uh, delight rests upon us uh, that beauty rests upon us god's beauty rests upon us and people see that and when people see the beauty of god in us they praise him and they say lord thank you thank you for you know sending this person to do these things for us so um, it's a lifestyle that we choose to live in a way that honors god uh, so mm, maybe just another few verses that we can you know quickly run through even as we have around 10 minutes left um psalm 65 verse 4 if someone could read out psalm 65 verse 4 Psalm chapter 65, verse 4. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house and of your holy temple. Yeah. Uh, now, these are people uh, that God has chosen and declared as acceptable. So only they are, in fact, allowed to come before his throne. Okay, so you may have a whole lot of people, you know, uh, coming into the church. But the ones who are actually coming into his presence are the ones whom he has specifically chosen. He has handpicked them. Why? Because they have chosen to abide in him. So, um, you know, um, everyone comes into God's presence in the sense God is uh, open to receive whoever comes to him. Um, and so in, if they have those, that repentant, open, receptive attitude in the heart, then even as they try to reach out to God, God will reach out to them. So some people who come into the church may be believers, some may be unbelievers. But if that person has an open heart, a receptive heart, a heart that is willing to learn, a heart that is willing to you know, submit. Uh, so if you have such a heart, then even as you're reaching out to God, God reaches out to you. Uh, but, but the point being made over here is that, so you see only such people are allowed to approach him uh, at the super uh, at, what in the, in the spiritual realm at the physical uh, realm of course everyone comes and occupies the seats everyone is uh, you know standing over there in god's presence but the ones who actually gain personal access to him it's all those people who are standing over there with open hearts receptive hearts they are willing to receive they are willing to hear they're willing to be corrected they're eager there's some something inside them that is hungry so they may, in fact, be an unbeliever who knows nothing about Christianity, knows nothing about the Bible, but they're standing over there. And there's this openness, there's this hunger, there's this longing to, to know God, even though they may not even realize that that's the longing which, you know, which is crying out deep inside. Such people, even as they are reaching out, God will reach out to them because such people, they are chosen by God and you know He, too, he's, he chooses them to approach Him. They are acceptable. So when we are in God's presence, it is good, of course, to rejoice, to celebrate, you know, to sing and to dance and all of that. Uh, but it is important to recognize that this is a privilege that is being given and it's a solemn privilege. So um, uh, in a lot of churches, we have, uh, you know, singing and dancing and jumping and shouting and whistling and all of that now are you doing all of this um in an attitude of worship to honor him or are you just simply giving expression to your human nature if that is all you're doing you know just because you're the kind who likes to dance and you're dancing that's fine as long as you're doing it in holiness you know it's coming out of that attitude of reverence and enjoyment of God. You're just enjoying God, enjoying his presence. And so you jump and you dance and you're connected to him in what you're doing. So whatever you would do, you would do it honorably. On the other hand, if it's just you functioning out of your fleshly nature, um, you would just be doing it to satisfy your own self because it makes you feel good. Uh, and there is a chance that you may end up expressing it in a sinful manner. So kind of, you know, let us be aware of this, even as we worship in our churches, uh, that he chooses who will approach him. He chooses who can come into his presence. Uh, so it's a solemn thing. So when we are worshiping him, 
uh, you know, like it says in your notes, it should not just be human fleshly revelry, rather it should be reverence. And uh, so you don't need to really worry about that. If you're a person, you know, who is walking in God and you're and you're connected to him and you have this desire to honor him, you will automatically be careful in the way you're expressing, uh, you know, your reverence. You may jump and, uh, you know, shout and and dance and uh, real, real crazy, but you're doing it, you know, really to honor him. So you would be careful to see that uh, you're not portraying yourself in a way which would disgrace the name of God. So that would automatically be the case. So you don't have to worry too much about that. I guess this is more of a point for those uh, who just do it for the feel goodness, you know, the, the good feel it gives you. So they whistle because, you know, whistling is something that's fun to do. Uh, I know, or I know they, they, they jump and they clap just because, um, you know, it just makes them feel nice in their flesh. So for such people, maybe they need to watch out a little bit and be careful about how they are doing it because they may get carried away. No harm in being <laughs> expressive and exuberant. It's your personality type. It's, it's who you are. Uh, but I mean, if you're not very connected to God, if you're not really abiding in him, there's a chance that you may end up expressing yourself in the wrong way for all the wrong reasons. So just kind of watch out, you know, just kind of better to be cautious about these things because you're coming into the uh, presence of a holy God. It's, say, it's talking about how this is his house, how this is his holy, uh, his holy temple. So when you, I mean, you want to dwell in his courts, um, you got to be a little careful about these things because he not only looks at the outward expression, but he also looks at the inside, the heart. With what kind of a heart are you doing these external acts of worship? So that's just something to watch out for, uh, something to be a little careful about. Um, we will uh, <clears throat> we will maybe conclude uh, with another two verses. Uh, uh, so if someone could read out uh, Psalm 110, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 110, verses 1 to 3. Psalm chapter 110 verse 1 to 3. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy majesty from the womb of the dawn, you will receive the dew of your youth. Oh my, am I still connected? Okay, my connection is kind of bad. Um... So it here it talks about how um, uh, you know in the millennium uh, in the millennial kingdom. Okay, so it's talking about how in the millennial kingdom, you know, his people, God's people, they will be arrayed in holy splendor. Uh, you know, they will be like this dew, early morning dew, which is so fresh and so pure and so clean and so full of um, you know vitality. He's uh, it says that God's troops will be like that they will be arrayed in holy splendor so um if we choose to abide in god and our connection to him is very strong we will be like this dew very fresh very pure very vital that is how we will be so we will be arrayed in that kind of a holy splendor okay so um then, of course, you know, I mean, uh, uh, like it says over there in the previous verse, in verse 1, it says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So it's, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who will, you know, make the enemies uh, uh, his footstool. But then we are, you know, um, involved in that process. We, we are partnering with him in subduing the enemy. And uh, so we will be able to do it because we are like that fresh morning dew. You know, we are full of vitality and life and we will be able to subdue the enemy uh, on behalf of, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, he ultimately does it through us. But, you no, know, we partner with him in achieving that. Uh, so uh, holiness causes us to walk in victory. It helps us to walk in victory. Uh, so maybe we can just close with that thought. There are a few more verses. Uh, we uh, we covered almost everything, you know, in 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 your uh, two chapters. Uh, but then you know you could just quickly go through it again in your notes, uh, you know, because there were some portions which we could not touch upon. Just a few, one or two. So you know, let's just close with a word of prayer because we are like out of time. Um, yeah, let's pray. 
Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that we could learn today. Lord, uh, we want to abide in you. We truly do believe that your word is the truth. It is 100% truth. And if we can hold on to it and uh, depend on it, rather than uh, listening to the lies which Satan keeps feeding us in our mind, we know then uh, we will be able to walk in victory. So help us, O oh Lord. Help us to do that. Help us, O oh Lord, to, uh, to allow ourselves to be sanctified by your word, by accepting that it is true, and by holding on to it no matter what. So we pray that you, O oh Lord, would empower us to amputate whatever is uh, contaminating us. Help us, O oh Lord, uh, to discipline ourselves, even though discipline is so painful. Lord, you guide us. You strengthen us to do these things, because then we can be like the dew of the early morning, and we can be vital and strong and fresh and pure, and be able to uh, subdue the enemy under our feet. Help us a lot to um, to actually walk into these things in our everyday lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.